All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. So what I plan on doing for all of you gathered here today is demonstrating both the use and the tactics of a flintlock musket. This is pretty much the standard type of musket that is going to be employed by all infantrymen during the War of 1812, be they British or American, or Canadian for that matter. So, real quick before I begin, who here has fired a flintlock musket before? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excellent. Well, I hate to say this, but you seven are still the minority here, so I'm going to go into Flintlock 101 for the rest of us. So Flintlock 101, for all of those who haven't, is this. The way that this musket is supposed to work is when I pull the trigger, this flint will flip forward and hit a piece of steel. That does two things. It knocks forward the piece of steel, and two, it creates a spark off of the piece of steel. That spark should fall on a trail of exposed gunpowder right here. That trail of exposed gunpowder should ignite, taking the flames inside the barrel, where that uh, flame should light off the powder in the barrel, which should explode, which should provide enough pressure to propel the musket ball out the end of the gun this way. Do you catch my drift? It's confidence inspiring. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say is that the gun does work. 8 out of 10 times, weather and other factors included. So when the gun fires, I want you all to gauge the distance between us right now and the viewfinders by the lakeside. At this distance away, I could hit a man-sized target that I chose somewhere at that distance away with a shot from this musket. Seems impressive, right? Until you realize that at three times that distance away, you can still kill it something, but that thing that you kill will not be the same thing you took aim at. That is because this is a musket. It is not a rifle. What is the difference? Round ball. Smooth bore. Believe it or not, whoever said round ball, we are still using round lead balls for the rifles in 1812. However, inside the barrel of a rifle, there are spiral grooves that are meant to catch onto a tightly fitting musket ball and cause it to spin on its way out of the barrel. When that ball spins, it flies straighter or farther. However, on a musket, since there are no spiral grooves in the barrel, a loosely fitting musket ball will be rattling around in the barrel, and when it is fired, it will bounce around in the barrel and fly off in whatever which direction it chooses past the 100-yard mark. So, ladies and gentlemen, only accurate up to 100 yards or so, and 8 out of 10 reliable. Does this sound like the best weapon in the world? No. No. So why, especially given the fact that rifles did exist in 1812, why are the regular United States troops being given these? Cheaper. They're cheap. I love how the entire center of the room knew it. So ladies and gentlemen, in fact, these guns are three times cheaper than the rifles in 1812. Want the bigger army? Go for the cheaper option. But there's an advantage to this as well. These guns can be loaded once every 15 seconds by a highly trained soldier. So let's do some quick math here. Three times as many guys, four times as many shots each. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, rifles in 1812 still take about 60 seconds to load. So for one rifle shot per minute, that same price will get you 12 musket shots in a minute. You see where the tactic is coming in now. Our mentality is quantity over quality, and if you shoot first, you shoot fastest, you shoot with the most guys, you will probably be at an advantage on a regular infantry level. So when I fire this gun, I want you to picture about 50 more guys beside me, shoulder to shoulder with me, doing the exact same thing, because that is how we maximize our effectiveness. We line up in those big wide lines of guys to cover more territory so that every 15 seconds there is a wall of flying lead raking the battlefield. And if that is not terrifying to you, then I highly advise that you seek help. <laughs> so, now all that remains to do is show you how it's done. I'll pick that up later. So this is what we're dealing with, ladies and gents. A cartridge, a tube of paper containing a pre-measured amount of black powder and a small lead ball. I'm going to tear open the cartridge with my teeth. You dropped something again. 
Oh, I know. <laughs> that was the top of this that I ripped off. <laughs> if I wasn't dropping it, I'd be worried. <laughs> so the rest of the powder is going straight down the musket barrel. The musket ball and the paper are also going down the barrel, and this steel ramrod is going to be used to ram the paper down on top of the musket ball. Now, contrary to popular belief, ladies and gentlemen, this does not affect the accuracy of the musket, but it does help me out in the sense that now when I point even slightly downhill, the musket ball is not going to roll out the end of my gun, leaving me with nothing to fire. So all that remains to be done now is to choose my proper target, take my aim, and of course, if you don't like loud noises, cover your ears. Fire. Oh, what you have just witnessed, ladies and gentlemen, was the discharge of a single firearm. The battlefield is not a single firearm. It is hundreds of these guns. It's about 12 of those cannons behind you over there, all going off at the same time. It is dark, it is noisy, it is smoky, it is confusing. And somebody in your uniform, sir, with your gray shirt and khaki pants and monochrome shoes, <laughs> you will blend in with the background. Do you want to blend in with the background on my battlefield? Sure, he said. Why? Uh, well, I get a better defense, I guess. Get a better defense, all right. So they can't see you, right? Perfect. Camouflage. Absolutely ideal for hiding you from your enemies. Guess who else it's great at hiding you from? <laughs> your buddy. Your friends who are 200 yards to your rear, formed up in 50 person wide lines, firing a volley together downrange every 15 seconds. And if they cannot see you, what is going to happen to you? Yeah, they're gonna kill you. So ladies and gentlemen, it is much preferred in our era when this is the tactic to wear bright colors. But it's not just bright colors you have to be distinct as well. So let's just say this. I can see, let, oh, you in the back there in the red. Perfect. I can see you from a mile away, but there is nothing on that red uniform that you are wearing to let me know who you are, where you're coming from, what equipment you're supposed to be carrying, who's in charge of you, how fast you're supposed to be moving onto the battlefield, where you're supposed to be moving onto the battlefield and why, and whether or not I should shoot you because of that. So, what do you do with a person like that on the battlefield? Shoot him. Shoot him, just in case. So, it serves better to be distinct, fancy, like, say, me. Now, I don't expect you to memorize the entire Codex of 1812 uniforms, but even amongst the other guys here, you should probably recognize who we are. Because this yellow lace, above all, lets you know that we are artillery. Some other guys around here may look like me, but they're wearing white lace. Those are infantry. And that's an important distinction, ladies and gentlemen, because you see, they're the ones who are supposed to be using these muskets, and I'm the one who's supposed to be using these cannons. We'll get to that later on in the day, though. So that is the whole purpose of wearing a bright, distinct uniform. So not only can you be seen, but you can be identified and commanded according to your speciality. So I've got one last thing to share with you all before I turn you loose. What is this, ladies and gents? Bayonet. Bayonet. What is a bayonet used for, ladies and gents? Scare tactics. Anybody going to contest that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you laugh, but ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you that the proper way to use a bayonet is technically not to use it at all? Here's my logic. The bayonet is not a melee weapon. It is primarily a psychological weapon. This thing is absolutely terrifying, and let me explain why. The three sides on this bayonet, when inserted into a human body, will create a triangular wound. Triangular wounds are nearly impossible to stitch up in a timely manner, even in the 21st century. On top of that, the point is sharp, but the blade is dull, meaning that the wound it makes will be ripped, torn, rough, and excruciatingly painful. And what do we know about big, open, bloody wounds on a battlefield that's about as clean as the ground you're standing on? Infection. infection occurs. So now you have an infected, unstitchable, excruciatingly painful wound. Does that sound appealing to any of you? No. I hear it a yes. Please help. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this whole thing is meant to scare you off the battlefield before things get too bloody. We will be firing our volleys at you just enough to reduce your numbers. 
Once we are sure that we outnumber you, bayonets will be mounted on the end of guns, we will present them towards you, we will begin walking towards you. That is your warning shot. So when you are faced with an outnumbering group of guys with these bayonets walking at you, what are you going to do? Run. Run. And here's something to sweeten the deal. If you're facing regulars like us, we'll let you go. No point in killing you if you're already leaving the battlefield. However, if you stand and fight, then is when we will use the bayonet. And by your painful example, everybody else will get the idea that it's time to move along, and then they'll move along before it gets any bloodier than it needs to be. I cannot stress this enough, ladies and gentlemen, but the objective on the 18th and early 19th century battlefield is take and hold. It is not obliterate your enemy. So if we can take and hold that piece of land that you're on without killing any of you, more glory and honor to us. But why? Well, you see, it's all about reputation, madam. Because right now, we're in an age where we're forced to face you from 100 yards away. The conduct is entirely different. I wish I could give you some scientific explanation, but in reality, it's more of a European moral code that is passed down to the Americans, even as far as 1815. Once we get into 1860 and the rifled muskets start occurring and warfare changes from line warfare to trench warfare, then things get absolutely more brutal. But for right now, we're still in an age where reputation counts. And if you kill everybody on the other side of the battlefield, you're not a soldier, you're a butcher. You lose reputation, you lose favor, you lose your job, which means you lose money, which means you cannot eat, which means you die. So, for us, this is a matter of life and death. Our reputation is everything. So the fewer of you that we can kill and still get you off the field, that's a better situation for us anyway. Yes, you're absolutely right. Later on in the 19th century, it does change, and things start making more sense in a modern context. Well, yeah, when you take the land, you can set up something to contradict that. And you're not the only ones on the battlefield. We've got artillery to, to set up to prevent them from getting as close as 100 yards. We've got cavalry to outride them. We've got riflemen corps to uh, basically harass them along the way, cut off supply lines. And we've got raiders to break the laws of war. To